Combat veterans of the United States Marine Corps recount the hazardous and lethal work they did during some of the most intense fighting of the war. On August 6, 1942, the Marines of the United States 1st Marine Division, which was commanded by Major General Alexander Vandegrift, observed from the rails as their troop ship, the United States ship George F. Elliott, entered the waters to the north of Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands, which are located in the South Pacific. They had arrived with the intention of capturing the Japanese-controlled airfield at Lunga Point, which was only partially finished before it could begin operations. The airstrip on Guadalcanal presented the Japanese with the opportunity to attack the shipping routes leading to Australia and suffocate the continent, so putting Australia in danger of being invaded by the Japanese. The familiar, mottled green camouflage uniforms of the Marines had not yet been issued. So the four Marines from H Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, Jim Young, Sid Phillips, Roy Gerlach, and Art Pendleton, was dressed in their steel helmets and green cotton twill uniforms. They were among the thousands of troops who were anxiously anticipating the battle that was about to take place. This is their account of events. Jim Young, on August 7, 1942, the day we were scheduled to fight the Japanese, we were roused from our sleep at approximately 3 in the morning. Breakfast was served at 5 o'clock in the morning. There was steak and eggs for the meal. We went up on deck to observe the bombardment of Guadalcanal once we had finished eating, which was a difficult task to accomplish. Not only was it unfathomable, but the noise was really horrific. The vast majority of us were terrified and confused. Even without yelling at each other, we were unable to hear each other. We have been given orders to go to the lower level and prepare everything for disembarkation. The ocean was choppy and hazardous to navigate. At precisely the moment when soldiers were getting ready to jump into boats, the waves caused them to plummet anywhere from 6 to 10 feet. Alternately, if the boat did not sink, it sailed up with a roar. The landing craft and the side of the ship collided, causing a guy to be crushed from the impact. It was a way that a lot of guys were injured. One of the men from my gun crew, a Marine PFC, had made it into the landing craft and had his hand on the craft's rail when our wiremen stated to lower metal coils of communication wire from the ship. As a result of a line breaking, the hefty coil of wire struck his arm, causing it to break. They brought him back on board their ship. Now was the time to go. The landing craft's engines were all operating at full blast, and they were all roaring. When we arrived, everyone was anxious, and we were on our way in. There was a flag fluttering on the stern of each and every landing craft, according to Sid Phillips. At the same time that I was looking over the side at the flags, my friend Carl Ransom was having the same experience. There was a huge line of them that you could see. It appeared as though they had reached the very end of the planet. A lump formed in my throat suddenly, as well as Ransom did. While he was wiping his eyes, he made a statement to the effect that the salt spray causes your eyes to water. We had never experienced something like that before, not even in training, and after that, I never witnessed it happen again a United States flag being displayed on each landing craft because they were such an easy target. It is a large old item that is red, white, and blue in color that proclaims, here I am. Now I am here. Our Colonel Cates, who was named Clifton B., a very patriotic Marine, Cates served as the commanding officer of the 1st Marine Regiment. If there was a command to fly a flag on each and every landing craft, I have no doubt that Cates was the one who issued the command. It was that morning that I observed that everyone's cartridge belt was stuffed to capacity and bulging. It was possible to make out the shining brass cartridges that were scattered throughout the belt. Each of those compartments contained two clips, each of which contained five bullets. There was never a single instance of live ammo being distributed to us during our mock landings in the Fiji Islands. Cartridge belts that were empty, flat, and flat were used to make the landings. 
They were certain that they did not want some moron to fire his firearm at someone. At this point, things were different. This was the genuine article. We were in that landing craft where the front end would drop down when we came ashore at Guadalcanal, the captain said. We took advantage of the front ramp since without it, we would not have been able to remove the mortar from the boat. When we arrived at the beach, we were anticipating a fight to the death that would involve hand-to-hand -hand combat. Following the descent of the ramp, we discovered our companions on the beach, laughing at us and cracking open coconuts. When we emerged from the landing craft prepared to engage in combat, they simply laughed at us. Before a few minutes had passed, they had carried out the identical action. In our immediate vicinity, there were not a single Japanese. Roy Gerlach, I did not enter the market during the initial wave. The majority of my time was spent working as a cook, despite the fact that I was a mortar guy assigned to the mortar platoon. When you were in the Marine Corps, you were given the job that you were intended to do, and if you were able to do something else, you did it as well. I could be found on the mortars whenever there was a fight going on. On the other hand, if they required a cook, I worked as one as well. When I first arrived at the beach, I don't remember exactly what happened. There were no Japanese present at that location. Every single one of them had fled to the hills. Almost immediately, we discovered all of these coconuts. They were tumbling down from the trees. We used our bayonets to make holes in the coconuts and then we drank the milk that was within. They became ill as a result of it. I believe that there is an excessive amount of fresh milk. We struggled through the jungle for the entirety of the first day in order to reach a hill known as the Grassy Knoll, which was located one mile inland, said Sid Phillips. The maps that we had for Guadalcanal were not very good. When they arrived, they found some charts that had been drawn up by some Australians who had visited Guadalcanal. It was the Australians who gave these rudimentary maps their names. They were so confused that they even got the names of the Tinaru and Ailu rivers mixed up. For this reason, the strategy called for going to the grassy knoll in order to take the high ground. My memory is so distinct that the thing that jumps out the most is the heat, the unbelievably high heat that was present in the jungle, where there was no air, the fact that we had just emerged from winter in New Zealand meant that the climate had undergone a significant shift. We were just complaining and grousing. In that forest, it is really hot, and when you come ashore, you are carrying a load that weighs 60 pounds as well. You should have an additional supply of ammunition, food for four days, and a change of clothes. The bedding is dropped, and you continue on your way. The amount of heat was really unbearable. At that time, we were only given one canteen. We were instructed in the discipline of water. Before you swallowed, you were only supposed to take a few sips of water and move the water about in your mouth. This was the standard procedure. It was never recommended that you drink a lot of water. On that first day, everyone came dangerously close to passing out from thirst. There was no water in the food that we consumed, so it only served to dry you out further and make you thirstier. We consumed crackers and cans of hash. We were out of breath by the time the first day came to a conclusion, and we were halfway up the grassy knoll. They instructed us to put ourselves in a supine position, dig a foxhole, be silent, and then go to sleep. As a result, we did. According to Jim Young, when morning arrived, we were given orders to return to the beach in order to set up defenses in an effort to thwart any attempt by the Japanese to land. In the middle of the night, a scorpion delivered a bite on the face of one of our lieutenants. He was absolutely blind as a result of the swelling that he had experienced, and he needed to be led by the hand on the lengthy journey back to the beach area. As we got closer to the beach, Around 10 Japanese torpedo bombers skimmed the surface of the water and went in the direction of the train. We were able to see the faces of the pilots and the large red meatballs that were attached to their wings because they were so low. They showed no concern about us when we were at the beach. They made a beeline toward the formation of ships in a convoy. 
there was a jet approaching our ship, Elliot, in a direct manner. The first thing it did was fall into the sea. Then it bounced up and finally collided with the ship. According to Roy Verlach, we did not have a galley for the first three or four weeks because our cooking equipment sank with the Elliot. Even though I wasn't on the ship at the time, I witnessed everything that happened. At that point, the majority of the men had arrived on shore. Nevertheless, the ship had not yet finished discharging its cargo. On the Elliot, there was a shipman that I was familiar with. It was a common occurrence for him to declare, I'm going to be here when you go, and I'll be here when you get back. However, he never showed up. Sid Phillips, I am frequently asked when we had our initial touch with the adversary. As soon as we arrived in Guadalcanal, we were very immediately attacked by hostile aircraft. The first thing you do is dig a foxhole and make it as deep as you possibly can. Then, you try to bury yourself with the earth. On the island of Guadalcanal, the strafing never stopped. The constant influx of them was a constant assault on us. That touch with the adversary was taken into consideration. The Japanese zeros would come swooping down on us. As Jim Young put it, it was possible for me to glimpse the faces of the pilots who were flying those airplanes. They appear to be looking down at you as they turned their heads to gaze at you. There were times when they were smiling. The day after we landed, we were able to take control of the airfield, said Sid Phillips. It came as a surprise to me when I first visited the airstrip that there were not many structures there, with the exception of the structure that looked like a pagoda. That was its function as the tower. Unless you were in the air, the runway was not especially noticeable to the naked eye. There was not a single Japanese plane that had crashed. It was a deserted location. We followed the pagoda to that location and had a look at it. A number of us were among the first people from the United States to enter that structure. To our knowledge, B-17 Flying Fortresses were the very first American aircraft to arrive at that location. There are other situations when there are three. Then, after stopping to refuel, they would go. In the beginning, we did not have any Navy or Marine planes at all. Until the Flying Fortresses arrived, H Company was able to observe a fierce naval engagement between the United States Navy and the Japanese Navy on August 9 from its bivouac, perched on a peak overlooking the surrounding beach. This event, known as the Battle of Savo Island, resulted in a significant number of ships sinking off the coast of the island, which led to the seas being given the name Iron Bottom Sound. It was like viewing a summer storm from a beach, according to Sid Phillips, who described the Savo Sea Fight. In addition to seeing what appeared to be flashes of lightning, you would hear the roar of naval gunfire when it occurred. You've witnessed lightning in the distance, where the sky is lit up, right? That was the kind of thing involved. Despite the fact that we were unable to view any actual specifics of the naval engagement, we expressed our excitement whenever a ship exploded. We presumed that our sons were the ones who were being flogged. The following morning, we witnessed a warship from the United States of America slowly passing by, right off the coast, with a portion of its bow blown off. It was said by someone that it was the Chicago. After that, we were informed of the catastrophe. In one single night, we lost four cruisers. There is a possibility that you could see a ship smoking three miles away. Not only were our supply ships still docked in the harbor, but they were also beginning to depart, going to leave us. A portion of our supplies had not yet been unloaded by them. On the other hand, they had to get out of there as well. The event that had taken place in the Philippines had given us the impression that we would be considered expendable at that very moment. On Wake Island, the event had taken place. The event had taken place on Guam. The fact that it had happened at every stage of the war in the Pacific up until Guadalcanal meant that we did, in fact, feel like we were expendable. Jim Young. We were all by ourselves on the island because our ships were not there, except for the food that we carried in our bags, which were K-rations. There was no food available. Following the dispatch of search parties to explore for food, 
we discovered reserves of Japanese rice and oats that would be sufficient to sustain us until the Navy could return with additional supplies. Due to the fact that the rice and oats were swarming with maggots and worms, it required a strong stomach to consume this. We discovered that if we poured the rice and oats into the water, all of the insects would float to the top where we could remove them by skimming them off. We set up our bivouac at the conclusion of a coconut plantation, close to a field that contained a little grove of trees. The trees were lime trees and we prepared lamid from citrus fruits. Warm water was utilized and there was no sugar available. Despite the fact that this stuff was bad, it was a refreshing change of pace to drink. This field contained some of the most peculiar vegetation I've ever seen. If you were to walk through them, it would appear to be a trail that has been traveled many times, but after 20 minutes, there would be no sign of where you had come from. Although we had not yet had the opportunity to get a close look at the Japanese, the air raids continued in the days that followed. One of our members was a real Marine and an old gunnery surgeon who was 50 years old. He was a very pleasant guy. They referred to him as Gunny Dixon. According to Gunny, we should dig foxholes. After we had completed our work, he took a single look at them and immediately began to giggle. His response was, well, well, they don't appear to have enough depth to me. Indeed, he was quite correct when he said, I bet by the end of the week they will be deep enough to stand in. It was impossible for us to do anything about the bombers that were flying over us. Not only did we lack airplanes, but we also lacked any weapons that could reach them. There was a whistling sound that could be heard when the bombs fell to the ground. On a certain day, the Japanese bombers arrived from a different perspective. On this particular day, they came directly from the ocean in the direction of our tree grove, when in the past they had always blasted the airfield from the takeoff point to the liftoff location. They were not after the airfield this time. Rather, they were after us. While I was observing them via my field glasses, I was able to see the pattern of bombs going off, and I was certain that it would hit us. A warning was yelled by me, and we had just arrived in our foxholes in the nick of time. Standing in the foxhole, it was impossible to do so. As if an earthquake had occurred, the earth was trembling. The air was thick with large bits of soil and the aroma of cordite was so strong that it was overwhelming. I find it difficult to accept that there was no fatality rate. We discovered a Japanese bunker in the vicinity of us that had space for perhaps 20 of us. During one of the days when they were utilizing it for an air raid, one of the boys let out a loud scream. The interior was really dark, despite the fact that the air raid was still going on. We all tried to get out of there as quickly as possible since it was terrifying. A lizard that was approximately six feet in length was perched on the top of the bunker, and its scaly tail had fallen down and made contact with the face of the marine. Instead of reaching up to brush it away, he reached up because he thought it was the guy next to him. Upon sensing the tail, he went completely insane. Upon its conclusion, each and every one of us had a good time. During the night, the Japanese dispatched a lone bomber who continued to fly around for several hours before he finally made the decision to dump his bombs. They intended to prevent us from obtaining any slumber by doing this. It was because of the sound of his engine that we gave him the nickname Washing Machine Charlie. There was never a break in the bombing raids. After some time had passed, Japanese cruisers and submarines began to fire upon us as well. One of the things that drove us crazy was the fact that we could see Japanese sailors rushing around their decks and manning the cannons. However, we did not own anything that would allow us to call them. When the naval conflict took place, all of our long-range cannons were equipped on the ships that were in the process of taking off. The rifle platoons, according to Sid Phillips, were responsible for daily patrols. An officer would lead a group of 15 to 20 men on a scouting mission, with the goal of determining whether or not there were any Japanese in a specific region. We hardly never went on patrols when we were in the mortar platoon. On the other hand, 
We did go out after an ambush, had been committed on a marine patrol, and the survivors had returned to our lines. As a result, they assembled a patrol consisting of 300 individuals to return to the area in order to retrieve our deceased. As a result of their desire for 181 mm mortar to accompany them, they approached the mortar platoon and announced, Number 4 gun is going. I was the one who made the announcement. Additionally, we were accompanied by Lieutenant Benny Benson, who served as the lieutenant for our gun. As they kept a watchful eye out for the adversary, the riflemen were on the spot. While we were, in the mortar squad, we were dragging ourselves along after them with that darn heavy gear. Our journey was around five kilometers long, and we carried the mortar the entire way. Either a portion of the mortar or the ammunition needs to be carried by you. As a person who was responsible for transporting ammunition, you'd wear a clover leaf of ammo on your shoulder. When we were in the tropics, it was a very difficult march. A lack of roadways was present. As a result of being on the ground in a dense jungle, it was not even necessary to see conflict in order to have a horrible day. It's possible that you trekked a long distance out and back, had to cross multiple streams, and walked through water that was waist deep, causing your clothes to get wet, your feet to remain wet, and your pants to irritate your crotch. If you try to put that pain into words, you will fail. As soon as we arrived at the location where the ambush had taken place, the mortar platoon came to a halt 150 yards away from the location and set up our mortar. We were going to provide our soldiers with mortar assistance in the event that the Japanese were going to ambush this large patrol. If you had merely seen where our soldiers were, you would have seen that we would have fired past them anyway. However, the Japanese had already left the area. We never did make it up to the actual location of the ambush. This old marine surgeon came walking back, and Benny knew him very well, because Benny was also an old marine. In our thoughts, 30 years old was considered to be an old age. It was Benny who asked, What's the scoop all about? This surgeon stated that all of the Marines had been beheaded and had their genital organs forced into their mouths to complete the execution. By placing our deceased on canvas stretchers and covering their bodies with ponchos, they brought them back to us. We had a burning animosity for the adversary from the very beginning. The Badan Death March was something that we had read about. During this march, American prisoners who had fallen exhausted by the side of the road were bayoneted. They were a defense battalion that had been present at Pearl Harbor, and we had a conversation with the 90mm anti-aircraft gun that was located close to our bivouac there. In addition to that, there existed the Goth Patrol. A few days after our arrival on Guadalcanal, a Japanese prisoner informed Colonel Frank Gotha that the Japanese's allies wished to surrender five miles west of our lines at the point where the Matanaka River met the sea. To force them to surrender, Gotha dispatched a patrol consisting of 25 soldiers. This, however, was an ambush. The slaughter of Gotha and his soldiers took place. Not more than three of them managed to get away by swimming back to our lines. He must have been a complete moron to believe that the Japanese would give up. We simply did not have a firm grasp on the adversary at that point. A Jap was not going to give up unless he was knocked unconscious, which was an extremely unlikely scenario. Nevertheless, even if you were to come across Jap unconscious, you would exercise extreme caution because it is possible that he is merely acting. It's possible that he will kill you. Japan quickly demonstrated that it was a vicious adversary. The Geneva Convention was disregarded by them. The prisoners of battle were subjected to torture before being executed. Hell, even after a man had passed away, they would continue to mutilate and abuse his body. The Marines and the Japanese quickly formed a deep-seated animosity toward one another. In my unit, I am not aware of any instances in which we have ever taken a prisoner. On August 20, the Marines received some unfavorable information, which was that the Japanese were preparing to land additional troops in order to reclaim the airfield. 
During the same day, a new fleet of aircraft was observed flying across the air. As Sid Phillips explained, it was late in the afternoon, and we were at our mortar position when we heard airplanes circling the field. We made a hasty retreat. The ridges were traversed by them when they arrived from the south. There was a deafening noise coming from all of the airplanes. Even when they were by themselves, they were quite loud. However, when you have the entire sky filled with them, it is truly remarkable. It was yelled out by someone that those were our planes. We totally lost our minds. The initials UNC were emblazoned on the bottom of the wing of a blue-gray SBD dive bomber that I observed when I looked up. We launched our helmets into the air to a great height. We were slapping each other over the head. Because they were so overjoyed, a few of the guys were crying with happiness. With the exception of those two or three flying fortresses that arrived, we had not encountered any friendly military aircraft. We had been subjected to frequent strafe attacks by the Japanese Zeros. The fact that we were able to see our jets indicated that Uncle Sam had made the decision that we would battle for this terrible island. In the first major battle of Godalcano, which took place on August 21, 1942, the Marines and the Japanese Army would face off against one another. 900 members of the elite Ishipa detachment had been landed by the Japanese, and they marched west along the beach in the direction of the airfield by way of the beach. The Marines of H Company waited for the enemy near the west bank of a small river that they referred to as Alligator Creek or the Tinaru. In reality, the river in question was the Ailu River, we took turns manning the defense lines during the night, as Jim Young explained. It was a terrifying experience. There was a dense jungle in front of us, and the nights were filled with darkness. We heard a wide variety of sounds, and some of us would fire a few rounds in front of us just in case Japanese forces were sneaking up on us or approaching from behind. One of the problems was that if someone shot, everyone became agitated and the entire line would become available. You can get the impression that a fierce conflict is taking place. Well, the general had enough of all the firing, and there was nothing to show for it. He became frustrated. He gave an order that stated, if there was any more of that crazy firing, he wanted to see dead Japanese, or else that unit would catch all of the working parties. Please allow me to tell you that the following night, the entire island appeared to be deserted because of how silent it was. It was only the sound of washing machine Charlie that could be heard. The Battle of the Tinaru River was the first official conflict that took place on the island, according to Sid Phillips. From the bottom of the ocean all the way back to the beginning of the airstrip, our lines ran in both directions. We were not able to establish a perimeter around the airfield because we did not have a sufficient number of personnel. Two men with rifles, two men with rifles, then possibly six men with a machine gun, their position hidden by logs and dirt, then two men with rifles, and two men with rifles, and so on. We were strung out in these holes, and every seven yards, there were two men with rifles, two more men with rifles, and so on. Because the jungle that surrounded you was so dense, you had no idea who was there or what kind of things were where. You, on the other hand, would lie there and listen to all of the various sounds that the jungle makes. There is a possibility that one of those iguanas, which is three feet long, is racing around, wrestling, and making a lot of noise. Wouldn't you be curious to know whether that is a damn Japanese or an iguana? Indeed, you did not sleep. It was important that you did not issue a false alarm. After some time had passed, you would eventually become accustomed to it, and you would start to feel a sense of satisfaction in the fact that you were able to differentiate between a creeping Jap and a land crab. It was as if the mosquitoes were slaughtering us. There was nothing, not even a repellent, present. For the entirety of the night, we did nothing but lie in those holes and feed those bugs. For a considerable amount of time, we had been subsisting solely on rice and nothing else. In a short amount of time, everyone was worn out and fatigued. 
If you were meant to trade off on watch with the soldier in your foxhole, you were expected to do so every two hours. There was never a moment of calm. Because the situation was so eerie, they would remove our squad leader, Sergeant Carp from Brooklyn, and place him on the outside of the area. The Browning automatic rifle Bayer was in his possession, and they desired to maximize his firepower in that position. Moreover, he had been in the Marine Corps for around three years and was an old-timer who was seen as being far more experienced than we younger members. He was placed on the periphery of the court each and every night with that BR. Art Pendleton, a Marine, was in charge of one of the 12 machine gun squads that were stationed on the H Company line. I was a corporal, as Art Pendleton put it. My enlistment in the Marine Corps took place at Worcester, Massachusetts in the month of January 1942. Previously, I was a very typical individual a rural boy hailing from the middle region of Massachusetts, which is known as horse and buggy country. I had a good time in school, up to the time when I joined the Marine Corps. I had never had anything even remotely like to an affair with a female. There is not a single drop of alcohol that I ingest. I had no prior knowledge of drugs. A very different way of life was being lived. Women, on the other hand, did differently. In our town, if you ever happened to observe a woman in the bear room, you would have a story to tell about it. I suppose that all of that has an effect on your character. When I boarded the train in Boston to travel to Paris Island, which is the boot camp and training center for the United States Marine Corps located in South Carolina, there were a great number of other men from all around New England who were also present. One of the individuals that ended up joining me in H Company was originally from Southborough, Massachusetts, which was located within a short distance of where I was previously residing. He went by the name of Whitney Jacobs. Despite the fact that Jacobs was a hairy, tiny guy and a physically strong individual, was not the kind of person who one would think of as being a Marine. At the time, the standards and procedures that were in place for membership were extremely stringent. It was unfortunate that you were not allowed to be an African American. The United States Marine Corps did not begin accepting its first black recruits until June of 1942. There would be more than 19,000 black Marines who would have served with distinction by the time the war was over. You had to have all of your teeth except for two, you had to be a certain weight, you had to be a certain height, you had to have a certain education, and the list goes on and on the dentist said. Although it might not seem possible, Whitney, Jacobs, who was only a child at the time, managed to achieve his goals. During the night of our first combat with the Japanese, our machine gun emplacement was located on the beach with a view of the ocean, while others were located on the riverbank. It was only possible for the Japanese to break through our defenses at the sand spit, which was the only possible location a portion of the beach that was located between the river and the ocean was known as the sand spit. A dam-like structure was the sand spit. All the time, the water was flowing over it in a trickle. If I had to guess, the only time the river would flow freely over it was when there was a significant amount of precipitation. The immediate vicinity of the sand spit, the river leveled off. In the event that the Japanese launched an assault, we were aware that they could easily traverse that stretch of sand, so we hung some barbed wire on some poles there. The angle was comparable to a right angle. We were the only gun that was that near to the sand spit, and we were the only ones there. Near the river was where you could find Whitney Jacobs, who was a rifleman. The rifleman, the machine guns, and the bars were located in the front of the line. Whitney had the impression that he had heard something that was not typical during the night. Instead of waiting for orders, he fired his weapon. Because the Japanese were present and attempting to cross the river, that single shot was the spark that ignited the conflict. A few shots were fired up on our defense line at the Tinaru River at approximately 1.30 in the morning on August 21, said Jim Young after the incident. There were a couple bursts of machine gun fire, which caused the shooting rates to increase. 
After that, everything went to bad. The Japanese unit had come marching down the beach, moving west, and when they got to the Tinaru River, they spread out and formed a front, said Sid Phillips, who was a member of the Japanese military. There were a few of them that moved stealthily through the creek. This was a pitch black night. In the foxhole, Sergeant Carp and his buddy, a Marine called Beer, had both fallen asleep prior to the attack by the Japanese. It was only that they were so worn out and so drained. They were both killed when a Japanese officer jumped into their hideaway and hacked them up. However, someone shot him before he could escape. As soon as the firing began, the blackness became almost as bright as light during the day. A pillar of flame erupted from our lines of defense. It was a very loud noise. We were aware that the true adversary was present. They were imposing and violent in their behavior. The Japanese had landed nearly 1,000 of the best men that they had from the Ishika detachment. Art Pendleton said, Initial attempt to traverse the dunes was unsuccessful because they ran into our barbed wire. Hence, they were forced to cross the river. It was covered in patches that reached up to the neck. From the very beginning, the Japanese put themselves in a position of significant disadvantage. A scream-filled horde of Imperial Japanese soldiers attempted to breach the border, according to Jim Young. At a time, waves of 50 to 100 guys arrived at the scene. On the defensive line, we had approximately 90 guys. Japanese individuals who were able to communicate in English were yelling, Marine, tonight you die, with the words, blood for the emperor. On the other hand, we began to cry back at them, F, your emperor, as well as go to hell, anything that has the potential to come to our minds. Coconuts were thrown into the river by the Japanese. By doing so, it was difficult to determine whether you were aiming at a coconut or the head of a Japanese person. Afterward, they made a charge across the river. A few of them were able to circumvent our defenses and were bayoneting our soldiers. A two-man foxhole was occupied by one of my closest friends, Crotty, who was from New York. He was serving on the front lines. From behind the foxhole, a Japanese officer had sneaked through the line and was approaching him from behind this position. Crotty and another Marine were in the foxhole, together. The second Marine had placed a bandolier of ammunition over the back of the foxhole and then rolled onto his back in order to pick it up. As soon as he looked up, he saw the Japanese officer holding his saber above his head. In order to shield himself from harm, the Marine brought his knees up to his chest. His kneecap was struck by the Jap's saber, which caused his knee to break through the shin bone and split his knee. It was then that Crotty turned around after hearing his friend scream. He fired his pistol barely in time to prevent the Jap from bringing the blade down for the second blow. The bullet penetrated the Jap's rib cage and exited his body beneath his armpit after traveling upward. He landed on top of them. As we were getting ready to bring the mortars into action, our lieutenant, Benson, was calling for us to get ready. For the time being, we do not have any power. While we waited, we watched the flashes and prayed for the first sign of dawn. A mortar required light in order to tell where you were shooting, so we just waited. The notion occurred to me, you wanted to see Japanese, well, here they are. My gun was waiting for me on the beach when the battle began, Art Pendleton exclaimed. The machine gun emplacement that John Rivers and Al Schmid had established was located on the bank of the river. As a former boxer, John Rivers was a very tough and pleasant individual. He was also quite nice. As a result of his decision to enroll, he had forfeited the opportunity to become a champion lightweight prize fighter. We had four heavy machine guns in our platoon and it just so happened that his was located in the same area where the Japanese crossed the river. It was John who was at the exact center of it all. We should not have been hit by the Japanese at that location. As they made their way over the river, they were submerged in water up to their necks. In all honesty, they served as food for us. John Rivers served as the gunner, while Al Schmidt assisted him as the loader, according to Jim Young. 
in spite of the fact that they had surrounded one another. On the deck of the ship, they were able to collaborate effectively. The Japanese were attacking them like herds of cattle, while their rifle was buried in a sandbag trench on the river. While Johnny was mowing them down, he was shot in the face, which ultimately led to his death. During the conflict, Al assumed the role of gunner and continued to battle until the Japanese dropped a grenade into his gun pit, causing him and his ammo carrier to sustain injuries. In spite of the fact that he was blind, Al continued firing while the ammo bearer shouted in his ear to direct his fire. A man from North Carolina who goes by the name Piefsky. On the line, Steve Boykin, who is known to be a very kind and courteous individual, was struck. One of his legs, the entire rear of it, was on the verge of being blasted out. Sliding him back off the line, his guys positioned him against a tree and set him down. One of the Japanese soldiers was able to break through and reach him. They stabbed him with a bayonet, but they did not kill him. The Jap took his own life. However, Boykin managed to survive. As the conflict continued to rage on, Whitney became aware that one of our machine guns had stopped firing. This was the machine gun that had been causing the enemy to suffer a great deal of damage. There is no way to maintain constant fire with a machine gun since the adversary will zero in on you if you do so. On the other hand, when you are in a circumstance like that, you do not operate with common sense. If you want to live, you have to fire. A few feet away from the silent gun installation, Whitney crawled to the location. While he was lying on his stomach, he looked into that position and yelled out. John Rivers had passed away inside, and Al Schmidt, who was blind and in poor health, responded to him for the first time. Once Whitney yelled, don't shoot, I'll go get help. He retreated and reported the incident to the officer, who was in command of the situation. Due to the fact that I was approximately 100 feet away from that place, our lieutenant immediately called my gun. In, we scrambled to get moving. The gun was wielded by the gunner, while the assistant gunner was responsible for carrying the tripod. It is my belief that a hand grenade went off between my legs as I was running up to the line to have a better view at where we are going. Although it did not come close to touching me, it did pull me up in the air a little bit. Wow, I thought to myself, how lucky are you if you are? It appeared that everything was so perplexing. Our attention was drawn to the gun position held by Rivers. There was no one present in it. The bodies of Rivers and Schmidt are both missing, and I have no idea where they are. Due to the fact that they were firing so hard, it was inevitable that they would be knocked back because Rivers' gun was completely shattered I just hurled it out of the emplacement where it was located. A large number of Japanese people were killed by that machine gun. I put my pistol back where it belonged. There we were, right in the thick of things. The Japanese officers were brandishing these elaborate sabers and were attempting to frighten the living daylights out of us by swinging them in the air. There was no possibility that our soldiers could have been terrified. They were prepared to take the lives of everyone, when your life is in danger, you forget about being afraid of what might happen. A state of fear does not exist in the world. After I had finished setting up the rifle, I immediately began firing it. Should you fail to do so, you are going to be put to death. Rivers' position was the focal point of the entire assault that the Japanese launched. There was a lot of confusion among the Japanese. While the battle was going on, our 81 mm mortar platoon, which consisted of all four tubes, was facing the beach in preparation for the possibility of a landing coming in from the ocean, said Sid Phillips. Now, the assault was coming from the right flank of our position. Along the river, our lieutenant led us in the direction of the battle and up parallel to it. All across the place were our foxholes. Due to the fact that our machine guns were so deeply embedded, it was difficult to make out any of them in the faint light. The weak light made it difficult for us to advance higher, and we kept sliding into foxholes, accidentally falling into a foxhole while carrying a mortar tube or base plate can be very unpleasant. 
A guy may be killed by it if it were to fall on him. We installed the mortars in the coconut grove in a direction that was parallel to the river, said Jim Young. We were not protected by any defensive cover at any time. You could have been in the center of a football field if you were there. The Japanese had seen us and began shelling us, so we had to go to work as quickly as could, concerned that we might not have sufficient clearance through the coconut leaves. The lieutenant expressed such concern. I said that I believe I would be able to make it through. When I shot the first round, I was able to knock a palm leaf off of a tree. However, the shell did not burst, so the lieutenant gave the order to fire for effect, which means to fire as quickly as you possibly can. There was a pile of Japanese dead right out in front of our new mortar position, about 30 yards away, said Sid Phillips, describing the situation. After we had climbed to the top, they had already slain them. In the opposite direction of the river, we were attempting to reach a region that was roughly equivalent to six football fields in size. Just like that, we continued to cover the entire territory over there. Our front lines were able to keep the Japanese backed up in the river, according to Roy Gerlach. As part of the 81 millimeters mortars, I was responsible for transporting shells to the weapons. A shell of three inches in diameter was fired by our mortar. The shell was deposited into the tube, and then it was launched into the air. It reached out above our lines and came down, killing anybody within 30 yards of its line of sight. Being a Mennonite and serving in the military did not concern me in any way, shape, or form. I guess I had a more open-minded perspective. The flares were the thing that impressed me. More than anything else, Art Pendleton said, it was possible to hear the explosion that occurred when they lighted a flare that they had shot into the air. Upon ignition, they produced a light that was extremely brilliant. After that, the parachute would eventually open, and the flare would gently descend to the ground below. Everyone came to a complete halt, regardless of what they were doing. It's not like you moved an inch. You were going to be shot if you even ventured to budge from your position. We lit flares, and they did the same thing. The sole purpose was to check positions and determine who was located where. It is likely that the flares were among the most hazardous items that were used during the conflict. We were firing heavy shells that weighed 15 pounds, said Sid Phillips. In the event that the thing goes off, it will be a thunderous explosion. It is simply incomprehensible to you. It would be a thousand times louder than that if you were to shoot the largest firecracker that has ever been made. We were definitely taken aback by the outcomes of the shell that weighed 15 pounds. After spending one day at Camp Lejeune, we were able to fire live ammunition. However, the range was located more than 2,000 yards away. Before that conflict, we had never experienced any close quarters combat before. When our mortars exploded, we witnessed Japanese soldiers fleeing to the ocean and the river to put out the flames. Their garments were on fire as a result of the explosions. Our number four guns suffered a misfire, and it had to be pulled out of service. Corporal Mugno's ramrod, which was used for cleaning the mortar too, had a sock tied around the end of it, and it came off and fouled the gun. It was complete and total anarchy. At one point, they attempted to flank us at the sand spit, Art Pendleton said before the battle. Due to the fact that another gun was located on our left, my gun was not firing at the sand spit to any extent. Further, the 37 mm gun was able to cover that as well. The 37 mm was a lightweight cannon, but it was equipped with canister shot, which is the same type of shot that is used to shoot game birds on safari. There was not a single bullet. Rather, it was a collection of metal fragments that were shooting through the air like a massive shotgun. It continued to fire over and over again. Regarding the sand spit, I did not feel any concern. It wasn't even something that crossed my mind. Taking care of what was in front of us wasn't enough to keep us from having our hands full. In order for them to reach us, they had to first pass through the river and then climb up the bank. We put an end to their lives. During the course of the conflict, 
Colonel Pollock, Lieutenant, said Sid Phillips. The commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion, 1st, Marines, Colonel Edwin A. Pollock, rushed over to our cannon and said, Who is the gunner here? While I was holding my hand up, he remarked, Well, boy, use me as the range stakes. He then ran out about 40 feet in front of the pistol and held his hand up. We moved the pistol in order to get him in the correct position, and I adjusted the sights so that they had zero deflection. On the other hand, I noted that beyond him, through the trees, there was an American amphibious tank that had been abandoned on the opposing bank of the river. The Japanese had successfully inserted a machine gun within that device, and they were firing off shots from within it. I was told by Pollock to attempt 300 yards. Despite the fact that our shot was perfectly accurate, it was slightly outside of the target. We brought our mortar down to the ground, and the third round that we fired immediately hit the tank. As if it were a touchdown in a football game, everyone along the line cheered at the same time. Near the end of the battle, Colonel Pollock, who was a great man, came to me and said, Stop firing. I said, I'm trying to take out a couple of guys that I'm seeing running there. He said, Don't. I said that I was trying to take out a couple of guys. He knew the battle was done and didn't want us to get killed. Nor did he want the other Marines who were surrounding the enemy from different directions. At that moment to be killed, he said, We don't know what's over there and we might open up another river situation here. I had a great deal of respect for him since he was our colonel. The Japanese attempted to eliminate us with a 75 millimeters howitzer cannon that they had wheeled up, said Sid Phillips before the battle. The wheels on it were made of iron, and at one point they attempted to drive us away from our mortar. In addition to that, they fired those knee mortars and grenade launchers at us. When those things went off, it sounded like you had slapped two pieces of two by four together. It was terrifying, a splinter, and if it hit close, it would scare the heck out of you. Jim Young, battle wound down, and it grew light. In the end, the Jap dead were piled three to five feet high. There may have been a hundred or more bodies in front of our 37 millimeters cannon that was placed on the sand spit which was the only way the Japs could strike without passing down the creek. Art Pendleton, I can remember looking at these Japanese soldiers who were caught in the barbed wire, and their heads were blown open and the brains and innards was dripping out of their heads. That scene is still with me nearly every day. Seventy years later, the Japanese soldier was very different from what you would consider the Japanese population. They're a kind, generous, easygoing nation of people who love nice things and are very delicate in their artistry, music, and everything else. Their soldiers, however, were brainwashed to the point where suicidal attacks were nothing for them, nor were acts of unspeakable brutality. We were a bunch of American kids. Our social system was different, and we were brainwashed, inasmuch as you do what you're told to do and don't question orders. But if someone told us to throw our lives away, we weren't ready to give it up. There's a big difference. Jim Young, 200 bodies were piled up in front of the gun position of Johnny Rivers and Al Schmidt. Schmidt survived the battle, although he was blinded. I could hardly believe I was seeing so many dead enemy soldiers. Some just looked like they were sleeping. Others were mangled. Some were burnt. Sid Phillips. General Vandegrift and his staff came right up behind our guns. Vandegrift was the top dog on Guadalcanal. He was within 10 feet of us. A corporal followed behind General Vandegrift with a 12-gauge pump shotgun, and he kept the shotgun at port arms. I don't even know if it was on safety, but all he had to do was point that thing and fire it. He stayed right with the general, and that's when my buddy Ransom said, Phillips, if you want to get your ass kicked, just go over there and stand between the general and that corporal. Our tanks didn't come up until maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. They passed. Right down the beach right there. You could have walked over and touched them. When the tanks got through, our whole 1st Battalion, A, B, C, 
D companies of infantry had circled around from the south, and they came around and drove all the Japanese survivors ahead of them out into the ocean. About 30 Japs ran out and jumped in the surf. Everybody kept firing at them until no more heads were visible. Jim Young. At about 2 in the afternoon the next day, the temperature was around 95 degrees. We walked among them, the dead Japanese, looking for ones that were still alive. Several of our men had been shot by Japs who were only playing dead. The colonel issued orders to shoot any one of them that might be alive. The smell of death almost took your breath away. The chaplains were taking the dog tags off the dead Marines. They said we lost 40 men. It was one hell of a night, and we were glad it was over. Art Pendleton, I can't even begin to tell you how many bodies were in the river floating around after this battle. You could hardly see the water. We killed almost 800 of them. They were some of their best men that used to train on Mount Fujiyama. They'd put on full marching gear and run up the mountain and run down the mountain. We never would have won that battle if we didn't have the advantage of the river. Their bodies were all over the place for two weeks. The crocodiles were ripping them apart. There were a few of them that survived and escaped back on their fast ships to the other side of the island. These men fought again, but they were all annihilated in the end. Sid Phillips. After it was over, Colonel Pollock came over and told us we had done really well and shook hands with everybody. This Japanese unit that hit us there was half of the Ishika detachment, an elite unit. They first went ashore at Guam and captured our Marines there. Evidently, they had gone through all the Marines' personal gear because the Japanese packs were full of snapshots of American people, Marines, and their girlfriends. We found about 100 of these snapshots after the battle. We collected up all the pictures of Americans and decided that the best thing to do was burn them. You wouldn't want to send them to the families, even if you could identify them. We kept all the Japanese pictures. You'd never burn them. You could trade them to sailors on board ships for almost anything, clothes, chewing tobacco. Money had no value, but you could do a lot by trading souvenirs. I opened one Jap pack that had three marine globe and anchor emblems in it. My friend Deacon Tatum got stuck with Carp's bar and had to clean his blood off of it. Art Pendleton, I remember two riflemen who were my friends. A big shell landed beside them and killed them both. It didn't just kill them. It blew them to pieces. Their names were Barney Sterling and Arthur Atwood. They would both receive the Navy Cross posthumously. Our lieutenant gathered me and a couple of guys, and we got ponchos and picked up their body parts. We carried them up through the coconut grove and dug their graves right near the end of the Henderson Field airstrip. That was the beginning of the Marine Cemetery on Guadalcanal. From that time on, there were a lot of graves in there. I never cared about going back to Guadalcanal but a friend told me it's a big cemetery now. The Battle of Guadalcanal went on for another six months and ended in a decisive American victory. The Lunga Point Airfield was renamed Henderson Field in honor of Marine aviator Major Lofton Henderson, killed at the earlier Battle of Midway. Today, the airfield is known as Homiara International Airport. See World War II Quarterly, Fall 2011. The island was not declared secure until February 9, 1943. By then, the American Marines and Army had lost 1,592 men killed and 4,283 wounded, while the Japanese were decimated, over 28,000 killed, missing, or dead from disease.